Attention all horror enthusiasts, get ready to dive in into the world of Chillian 2.0. They've revamped everything to bring you an enhanced listening experience with a brand new look. The best part, Chillian is now completely free. Yeah, you heard it right. No more barriers, just pure spine-tingling enjoyment at no cost. And get ready for an expanded library of terror. Explore a vast range of new content, including full-length novels, gripping podcasts, and so much more. We've curated a collection that will keep you on the edge of your seat, craving for more. And discover exciting features like creator profiles where you can follow your favorite narrators and authors. Stay in the loop and never miss a release again. Engage in lively community discussions and connect with fellow horror lovers and exchange spine-chilling recommendations. Embrace yourself for the ultimate scare. Chilling now has video content coming your way this summer. Get ready to witness horror unfold before your eyes in a whole new dimension. So why wait? Start your free listening journey on Chilling today. Unleash the fright and immerse yourself in a world of tales that will haunt your dreams. Download the app and embark on an unforgettable horror experience. I was going to escape, not by digging a tunnel or scaling a wall or bribing a guard. I was going to escape by studying. You see, I lived in a small town miles from anywhere, and the older that I got, the more it felt like I was imprisoned. There was nowhere to go, nothing to do, no jobs with prospects. My prison did not have any perimeter walls. But its dusty main road, dreary buildings, and stifling atmosphere felt just as bad to me. That was why I needed to get out. I was going to work hard at school. I was going to read the textbooks that I was meant to read, rather than the graphic novels about warped superheroes, which had been my go-to literature in the past. I was going to spend time using the online resources recommended by my teachers, not immersed in games set after an apocalypse. With the grades that I got as a result of this, there would be a whole load of academic institutions that would welcome me with open arms. All the ones that I had applied to were a long way from my hometown. I would have well and truly escaped. But it didn't work out like that. I couldn't finish a single chapter in a textbook or stay on the right page online before my attention wandered to something more interesting. The TV, a free trial of a must-play game, a new novel. I was surrounded by distractions. What chance did I have? So, by the time that I had handed my essays in and sat in the test, I was no more educated than I had been a few months before. I had watched some great shows, zapped my way to a close to a record score, and read some amazing graphic novels, but none of those counted in my favor as far as the universities were concerned. My applications were all dead in the water and I was stuck, a lifer. One morning a few weeks ago, I was staring into my bowl at the cereal and I sighed. I sighed a lot. My dad was pouring more syrup over his pancakes and my mom was drinking iced tea and reading a magazine. I sighed again. My mom looked up from her magazine. The people on the front cover all looked like a million dollars but were wallowing in scandal according to the captions. You know what you need, she said. Here comes a lecture, I thought, and I didn't even have the strength to sigh. What you need to do, she continued is to get a job. The convenience store out of town is hiring. My cousin Betty saw a sign in their window. I moved the cereal around inside the bowl with my spoon and thought that for once my mom was right. It was time for me to take drastic measures. It was time for me to get a job. I told myself that it would just be a temporary thing as well, you know, working in a store because I would reapply to the universities after I had done some serious studying, and then resat my tests and resubmitted my essays, and gained dazzling grades. 
and then I would be gone, a free man. I headed for the door and made a vow that this time I would stick to the plan. The store that mom had been talking about was situated by the road and scrubland outside of town. There were no other buildings and I guessed people shopped there because they were passing by and it was easier than finding somewhere that looked less shabby. As I got out of the car and looked up at the faded lettering painted in the window saying, open 24 hours a day and we've got buckets of bargains, I started to have second thoughts. No one in my hometown ever went to the store as far as I knew. Everybody shopped at the local discount store on Main Street and swore that it was the best in the world. It was run by one family and it had been forever, so there was no chance of me getting a job there. I hesitated. I really did need to do something to change my life, and if that was getting a job in the out-of-town convenience store, then so be it. Sometimes you just have to reach for the stars, or push the door and step inside. There was air conditioning on in the store, but all its energy seemed to be going on making a loud rattling noise, rather than lowering the temperature. Conscious that I was dripping with sweat, I wiped my sleeve across my forehead and tried to flatten down my hair, so that I looked smart enough to hire her. I hadn't been able to see a notice in the window advertising for staff, but was working on the assumption that they were still looking. And then a bright and eager young man like me, with no hair sticking up as far as I could tell, would be a definite for the job. Now I just needed to find somebody in charge. There was a couple of tills near the entrance staffed by two lethargic looking men. They didn't look much older than me. One of them had a wispy mustache growing above his upper lip and the other had a tattoo coiling up his neck. They both wore t-shirts with, ask me about today's special deals printed on them. Neither had batted an eyelid at me, and knowing what today's special deals were would have to wait as far as I was concerned, so I ignored them and headed down one of the numerous aisles. The shelves were stacked high with cans and boxes and packs of food and household items. The arranging of them looked pretty chaotic to me at first glance, with things like jars of coffee balanced on sacks of dried dog food, bookend by apples that were starting to turn. But what did I know? I was new to the retail industry, but keen to learn. I thought this as I looked around for any sign of someone who might be a manager. There were a handful of shoppers piling cans and the rest in trolleys, and another young man who must have worked there because he was restocking shelves and wearing a matching t-shirt, but there was still no sign of a boss. I reached the end of the aisle and was standing there deciding whether to go left or right when I realized that I was being eyeballed. The man who was staring at me was dressed in a beige uniform that looked vaguely like the type that law enforcement officers wore but he was no cop. He was clearly a store security guard, and it turned out that he seemed to think that I was up to no good. He stuck out his chest and growled. I've been keeping my eyes on you boys since you came in the store. You don't seem much interested in buying anything, but you are having a good look round. You sizing the joint up, boy. You planning a heist? His voice rose in volume as he said these last words. I figured he was hoping that I would crack under pressure and admit that I was a desperado, but instead I said, No sir, I'm just looking for a job. His chest deflated and when he spoke again, his voice had gone up a couple of octaves. Oh well dang, I thought there was going to be some action here, dang, you said you're looking for a job, come with me. And with that he wheeled sharply away and set off walking along the ends of the aisles. I fell into step behind him. At last, I seemed to be getting somewhere. We walked past the last of the aisles around precarious looking stacks of empty boxes, over a cable coiled across the floor, and into a narrow corridor at the end of which was a door with a small sign on it saying, Store Manager. Y'all wanna knock on here, son, the security guard said. Man, good luck. And then he strode off with a determined expression on his face. 
and desperados of the world beware, I thought. I flattened down my hair one last time and then I knocked on the door. A woman's voice drifted out telling me to enter. I turned the handle and I went in. The office was cramped and poorly lit and dominated by a desk that was overflowing with paper. The woman who was sitting behind the desk smiled at me. Now some people say that you shouldn't judge on first impressions. Others say that the first five seconds after you meet someone, new determines the rest of your relationship, professional or otherwise, for the duration. The woman behind the desk looked tired and kind of sad, kind of weighed down, and I immediately liked her. People that radiated success were my antimatter. Whether it was the popular and good looking kids at school or entrepreneurs online, I felt driven away from them. People like this woman who appeared to find life a struggle were much more my type. I would say that she was in her late 30s. She wore a dark business suit and had blonde hair that hung loose. Her jacket had a lot of stray blonde hairs on it and I noticed as well that her fingernails were bitten to the quick. She was still looking at me and smiling and I realized that she was waiting for me to say something. I thought quickly and came up with the less than brilliant opening line of, Hi, how are you doing today? Oh yes, hello. She said, her smile wavering. I'm okay, thank you. I'm Donna, the store's manager. Can I help you with something? Do you have a complaint about something that you bought here? Our no returns policy is clearly marked throughout the store. After a moment's confusion, I worked out that she thought that I was an unhappy customer. Oh, no, I'm actually here hoping that you would give me a job. I see, she replied. Do you have any retail experience? And do you have your resume with you and the names and contact details of two referees? I had none of those things, so I stood there feeling flustered. Getting a job was stressful. She looked at me. Her eyes were blue and a bit bloodshot and impossible to read. I couldn't tell whether she was about to tell me to stop wasting her time and leave or take pity on me. She turned her attention to the storm of papers strewn across her desk. She extracted one sheet, studied it for a moment, and then turned back to me and said, I don't have any vacancies in the day shift, which leaves the night shift. For the night shift, I prefer to hire those who might struggle to find work elsewhere. I believe in giving them a chance to earn an honest living, no matter what baggage they might have. You're clearly an ordinary kid whose face fits in the crowd, so you don't need a helping hand from me. But having said that, I am short of staff for the night shift this week, so I could offer you temporary work. How does that sound? It wasn't what I had been hoping for, but I decided to go for it. It sure is, I said. What time do I start? Her smile turned to full beam and then she told me, The night shift starts tonight at 10pm, so if you arrive 20 minutes early, you can have your introduction before you begin your first shift. And then we shook hands and that was it. I was employed. I went home and spent the rest of the day in a happy days. I imagined how this could be the start of a brilliant career for me. I might not even need to go to university. I'd be such a success in the night shift that I would be offered the job of a deputy store manager and within a few months, I would be running my own store and then my own chain of stores. I'd be a millionaire by 30. I would have a sports car and a private jet and my girlfriend would be a fashion model. I might even be on the front of a glossy magazine. The front door closed and I heard my mom calling out. You better have done your chores. It brought me back down to reality. I looked around the kitchen. The sink was still piled high with dishes. The refuse bin was overflowing. I'm sorry, I don't have time, I called back. I have to go to work and then I hurried out the back door. I made my getaway and then parked up a couple of miles away and sent my mom a message explaining about my new job at the store and how that I would see her and dad for breakfast. Then I put my phone in my pocket and I drove on. 
I didn't want to be late for my first night at work. As it was, I was early. There had been zero traffic on the road to slow me down. Not a single vehicle heading the same way. In fact, I didn't even see headlights in the distance. By the time that I parked up outside the store, I was wondering if the night shift was going to be very quiet and intensely boring. Sitting there, watching the evening sky redden, I hardly saw any customers entering or leaving the store. Yep, I thought. They call this a graveyard shift for a reason. By the time that I dragged myself out of my car and trudged over to the store, I was feeling as lethargic as the two till clerks that looked earlier. They were still there, sitting by their tills in these stupid t-shirts serving no one. Once again, they ignored me. And once again, I blanked at them as I walked on by. I saw the same security guard patrolling the aisles and gave him a thumbs up. Hey, I got the job. I called over to him. He grinned back and I carried on to the manager's office. Her door was open so I went right in. She had had her head in her hands and I had the awful feeling that she might have been crying. Which left me standing there wondering if I should say something or quietly back out of the room. I was still trying to decide when she looked up. Hi again, it's me, I said, once more displaying my brilliant conversational skills. She sniffed and dabbed at her eyes with a tissue and told me to follow her. Relieved that we were skirting over the whole her being upset thing, I did just that. It was time for my introduction. She showed me where the fire exit was in the staff room for when it was my break. She showed me the storeroom and the walk-in refrigerated area where perishable goods were kept before they were put out for sale. This was basically a very chilly room that made my teeth chatter while I stood there listening to her explain. There was a small door at the far side of this room marked Deep Freeze. There was another sign below spelling out in red letters, No Entry. I was about to ask her what was in there when she led me back out into the front of the store. The lethargic store assistants were getting ready to leave, along with the other assistant that I had seen stacking shelves in the morning and the security guard as well. Donna said goodbye to them in turn, and that left just the two of us in the store as far as I could see. She smiled and said, The rest of the night shift staff will be here soon. In the meantime, are you good with manning the fort? I answered with a smile of my own and she left. I scratched my head and I looked out the window. It was dark by now. A clear night though. I yawned and was still yawning when the door opened and the oldest man that I had ever seen in my life had walked in. His wrinkles had wrinkles. His eyes were watery and most of the hair on his head was sprouting from his ears. He was stooped forward and walking incredibly slowly and wheezing every step of the way. He was also wearing the beige imitation cop uniform of a security guard. Now, I was brought up to respect my elders and honestly I did, but this was one ancient dude. No way that he could cut it as any kind of enforcer of law and order, even in a convenience store in the middle of nowhere. He lifted his head to look at me, and I was surprised that there wasn't a creaking sound and then he carried on his way, inch by torturous inch. I shook my head, and then I noticed that someone else had appeared while I was watching the security guard. The girl walking through the door was about my age. She was five foot nothing tall and had long jet black hair that matched her fingernails and lipstick. She also had very pale skin or makeup on which made her look washed out in a cool goth kind of way. I knew even less about makeup than I knew about girls. The color of night trend continued with her clothes. Her knee length dress was paired with black stockings and black boots. Despite the cooling temperature of the late hour, I started to feel hot again. She was gorgeous, and she had noticed that I was staring at her. My cheeks began to burn. An 18-year-old man blushing was not a good look, I knew, but there was nothing that I could do about it, and she was headed right towards me. Hey, she said, 
I'm Katie. You must be new here. It's nice to meet you. She held out her hand. I stared at it for far too long, knowing that I was meant to shake it. But the signal between my brain and my hand had gone missing. I made a grunting sound instead and waved at her, even though she was just standing a few feet in front of me. She looked embarrassed and sounded unsure when she said, Well, uh, welcome to the team. I look forward to working with you. And then she headed off, leaving me standing there feeling like the complete loser that I was. I grimaced and shook my head, and tried to think of a reason that I could reside and go home and tie to my room. My train of thought was interrupted by the sight of two more new arrivals. They were now moving as slowly as the security guard, but they were shuffling along at a very sedated pace. They had vacant expressions on their faces and when neither of them acknowledged me, I knew that these two must be working the tills. And sure enough, they lowered themselves into the seats behind the little conveyor belts and sat there looking like the dictionary definition of lethargic. I left them to it and I wandered down an aisle. The manager had explained to me earlier that one of my tasks was to check for any gaps on the shelves and to restock them. I was considering a display of giant value cereal boxes when Katie had reappeared. She was wearing a t-shirt over her dress which read, Our prices will still be low when the sun rises. I saw that she had another three identical t-shirts draped over her arm. She smiled and held one out to me. I didn't think before I opened my mouth and said, Oh, no way do I have to wear one of those. They're so dumb. And Katie flinched and lifted her feet. Oh, okay, she said. It's just that I make them myself. I want to work in fashion and Donna pays me a bit extra to create new t-shirts for the staff and build up my portfolio. Still not looking at me, she walked away. I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me at that point. Until a few minutes ago, there had been the fraction of a chance of anything romantic happening between me and this beautiful young woman. Now, there was zero likelihood. I smacked my forehead with the palm of my hand and said out loud, Idiot! And then I went back to looking for gaps on the shelves. But my heart was not in it and as time dragged on, and the occasional shopper drifted by in the background. I found myself standing back near the tills. I had not replenished a single thing and it was not even midnight. And I understood now as well why the two till assistants looked so devoid of enthusiasm. One of them was serving a customer slowly moving each item over the scanner. And when it had beeped, putting the item in a cardboard bag... There was a dull rhythm to this which was strangely hypnotizing, and I found myself listening for the beep of the scanner, watching his hand carrying the item across, listening for the beep. And then I noticed a fly circling his head, and another one crawling across his cheek, and this brought me out of my daze. He did not seem to be aware of the flies, though. He just continued swiping, the other tell assistant, meanwhile, was staring blankly into space. They were both wearing one of Katie's t-shirts. As I looked at these, I felt a fresh wave of regret and decided that I needed to snap out of it and to do the right thing. I went to find her to apologize and to tell her that I really wanted a t-shirt. She was in the storeroom opening yet another cardboard box. I took a deep breath and I went in. Hey, I'm sorry about earlier. I was wondering if I could still have a t-shirt. You know, to be a part of the team. I mean, you've got one on and both the guys at the tills. Sorry, I don't know their names. It's Frank and Frank, she told me. She sounded and looked brighter when she said this, and my spirits rose as well. Seriously? I replied with a smile on my face. They're both called Frank. She nodded. Yeah, I think so. And they never really talk, so it's hard to be sure. But that's what I call them, and neither of them had ever corrected me. Hey, fair enough, I said. How about the security guard? Is he frank as well? She laughed, and that made me feel even better. Oh no, silly, she said. That's Mr. Oliver. He's lovely, and he's a very good security guard. 
I didn't try and say anything funny about his age. I just agreed and when Katie told me that she had to get back to work, I returned to my shelf, check in with a spring in my step. A little while later, Katie walked past and smiled at me. I had noticed that she never seemed to show her teeth when she smiled. She must have had a retainer, I figured, and was self-conscious about it. Something which made her even more attractive in my eyes. I moved to a new aisle, still looking for those gaps. My mind soon started wandering again and I started feeling bad for not checking to see if my mom had replied to my message. I assumed using a phone while working was frowned on. So I checked and there was no sign of the manager so I took out my phone. There was a reply from my mom sent not long after I had messenger. She said that she was happy that I had followed her advice and asked if I was rushed off my feet. That made me laugh. I was the opposite. I thought the best way to explain would be to send her a little film of the deserted aisles. Keeping my phone low to try and be discreet, I turned on the camera and without looking into it, panned across the aisle. Capturing a whole lot of nothing, I thought only just at the moment that Katie walked past the end of the aisle that I had been filming. I turned the camera off but she had not noticed me and was soon out of sight. I considered not sending the video to my mom but decided, hey what the heck, Katie would have only been in it for a couple of seconds. My mom wouldn't care. I attached the clip and pressed a reply to my mom's message, and then immediately hid the phone back in my pocket. I didn't want to push my luck. With rule breaking over, I went back to the shelves and their gaps. Around 2am, Donna came out of her office and told me that it was time for my 20 minute break. My stomach was grumbling but I had not brought anything to eat or drink with me which wasn't a problem considering where I was. I got some chips, a pepperoni stick, and a can of cola off the shelves and I went to the tills to pay. There were no customers. The security guard was sat on a plastic chair by the entrance. His head was drooping and I think that he might have been asleep. The two assistants, the two Franks, if Katie was right about their names, were sat at their tills looking blankly ahead. There were more flies on them and it struck me for the first time that their skin had a grayish tint to it. Hey, I said to them. I guess it doesn't matter which one of you guys serves me. A pretty dumb thing to say but I was trying to be friendly. The two Franks turned their heads slowly and gazed at each other for a minute. As crazy as it sounds, it felt like they were almost having a silent conversation. And then one of them looked at me and raised his hand. I figured he was indicating that he would serve me so. I put my items on his conveyor belt. Grindingly slowly, he picked each up in turn and moved them over the scanner. Three beeps sounded. I paid, picked up my stuff and headed to the staff room. When I arrived, my heart did a little jump. Katie was there. She was engrossed in reading a paperback book but looked up as I entered. I apologized for disturbing her. No, it's not a problem. She replied and closed the book. So, how's your first shift going? She asked. Feeling delighted that she wanted to know, I grinned at her and said, Not bad. I just got served by one of the Franks. It was a bit of an odd experience. Oh, don't worry about it, she told me. They're a bit eccentric, sure, but I like them. They live out by the old military base. There's a whole community out there living off-grid. I've been past and seen them, but I've never visited. I think most of them are ex-military that used to work at the base. I nodded enthusiastically. The old military base was one of those places my parents had always warned me to avoid, though they had never really said why. There were rumors about secret experiments and cover-ups, but I'd always dismiss those as conspiracy theories. I was considering if I should ask Katie if she wanted to drive out there in the daytime and see what was really going on. When she got to her feet and told me that she needed to get back to work, I was left with butterflies in my stomach and thinking how hanging out with Katie was the most amazing thing. And then I demolished my stacks and went back to work. 
I was getting the hang of my job by now and learning where everything was in the storeroom when I needed to replenish a shelf. I was carrying a four-pack of tinned fruit to its new home, feeling pleased with myself when I saw a customer standing halfway along an aisle. He was tall and skinny and was wearing a long baggy coat that was too big for him. There was something about him that set off an alarm bell in my head, and I paused, wondering if he was up to no good. And sure enough, he reached out, picked up a big block of cheese and put it inside his coat. And then he moved down the aisle and did the same with a tin of processed meat. My heart began to race. This guy was a shoplifter, and somebody needed to challenge him. If the security guard that I had met the day before had been on duty, I would have found him and told him what was happening, and he could have taken care of the thief. But standing there as the man pocketed another ten, I thought about the old ancient security guard. He would be no use whatsoever. I made a decision. I put down the tins that I was carrying and I walked towards the shoplifter with a determined expression on my face. You, I said, trying to sound like I meant business. I saw what you're doing. He looked at me. There was a coldness in his eyes. He didn't look in the least a bit scared of me. He even started to smile. I swore to myself realizing that I had made a mistake, but it was too late for me to back out now. He was muttering obscenities at me, and his fists were clenched. And suddenly, he lashed out. His punch hit me on the chin and I fell backwards as pain flared from where I had been struck. Then as he stepped over me, he brought his boot down out of my stomach. The pain from this new blow took my breath away and I curled up into a ball to try and protect myself. But he was walking away. I heard him laugh and then lost sight of him. And I was lying there groaning when I heard someone say, What's happened? I glanced up and it was Donna and Katie was behind her. They both looked shocked and concerned. I tried to sit up. This man, he was stealing things, I managed to say. I tried to stop him. Donna and Katie both came over to me and helped me to my feet. And then Donna shook her head and said, You shouldn't have done that. You might have been seriously injured or worse. Next time, you alert the security guard and let him handle things. Is that clear? She was clearly angry with me and that surprised me. I could only mumble an apology and a promise that it would never happen again. Still shaking her head, Donna asked Katie to take me to the staff room and sit with me for a while to check that I was okay. Back in the staff room, I rubbed my chin and felt my stomach and decided the only serious harm that had been done was to my pride. Hey, don't feel bad, Katie told me. Donna used to run the store with her husband. They were childhood sweethearts and got married around the time that they took on the place. Last year, her husband confronted a shoplifter. The man turned violent and Donna's husband was badly injured. He... Her voice started to break. She took a deep breath and said, he died. I understood then why Donna had reacted the way that she had to my naive attempt to stop the shoplifter. After asking me if I was going to be alright, Katie went back to work and I was left with a lot to think about. Not least the fact that I was by now hopelessly in love with Katie. I wanted to marry her and live in a house with a picket fence. We would have three children and a barbecue in the backyard every Sunday in the summer. Of course, I would have to get the courage to ask her out on a date first, and then sooner rather than later introduce her to my parents. Thinking of them made me remember the last message that I had sent my mom. Wondering if she had seen it and replied, I took out my phone. The words, message failed to send, was on the screen, and I saw that I had no reception. It wasn't a problem. My mom was probably fast asleep anyway and I would be seeing her in only a few hours. I started to put my phone back into my pocket and then I stopped. I wanted to watch the film so that I could see the few seconds that Katie had been in it. She was so beautiful. I pressed play. The view passed along the shelves and along the empty aisle. 
until it reached the end where Katie had walked past and should have been caught on film. But she wasn't there. It was only more empty space. Frowning, I pressed play again. No, she wasn't in the film, which was weird. I was about to check for a third time when Donna stuck her head around the door and asked me how I was feeling. I wanted to tell her how sorry I was about her husband, but I figured that now wasn't the best time. So I told her that I was fine and ready to get back to work. There must have been a few more customers in because there were new gaps on the shelves. Uh, not for long, I said out loud to myself and set off to the storeroom. After a while, I started to feel hungry again. A candy bar that I could eat while working would be ideal, I thought, and after choosing one, I headed to the tills. The security guard was still by the entrance, still borderline comatose. The Franks were still staring off into space. And the door was opening and two men were entering the store. They had plastic masks covering their faces and they were armed. I froze. This was a nightmare. One that unfolded at speed. One of the intruders began to shout, telling us not to do anything stupid. The other checked out the rest of the store, returning moments later with Katie and Donna. They had their hands on their heads and looked as terrified as I felt. And then the first intruder yelled at the Franks to open their tails, which they did but at their own slow pace. This drove the intruder crazy and he began to scream at them. Katie began to cry and this got her screamed at as well. Everything was escalating and I had a sickening feeling that someone was going to get badly hurt. The only person that was not freaking out was the ancient security guard, Mr. Oliver. All the shouting had woken him up, but he was just sitting in his chair by the entrance. He scratched his chin and looked at the intruders. Now then, fellas, he said, his voice scratchier than an old vinyl record. There's no need for all this threatening. Why don't you head on out and we'll forget about this whole thing. The intruders looked at him for a minute and then burst out laughing. Mr. Oliver tutted and said, I gave you a fair warning. And then he got slowly to his feet. There was a cracking sound as he did. I thought this was his old bones protesting and having to move. And he did wince as if he was in pain. And then he arched his back and his arms reached out, and he began to change. Thick dark hair began to grow from his face and his hands. His fingers stretched out, and he kept on growing. The nails on the end of each finger were lengthening as well. I watched in horror as they changed into razor sharp claws. The rest of his body was also expanding. His uniform tore open in places to reveal not skin but a pelt. His shoes split and paws were exposed, each tipped with a vicious looking claw. The feeble, slow old man had been transformed into a wolf that stood upright. It threw back its head and howled and then turned its gaze on the intruders. Its fangs glistened with drool and its eyes sparkled with murderous intent. Transfixed by fear, the intruders stared at the creature which the old man had become. It began to snarl and took a step towards them. The intruders dropped their weapons, turned tail, and ran out of the store. I stood there with my mouth hanging open. Isa, I began to say. I wanted to say shapeshifter, but surely they only existed in the realms of comic books and TV series. And yet there was one standing a few feet from me. It was no longer snarling and was not showing any signs of aggression to those of us left in the store. And then things got even more bizarre. Donna walked up to the creature and patted its arm and said, Thank you, Mr. Oliver. I don't think we'll have any more trouble from those two. In response, the creature smiled. I swear on all that's good it did. It smiled and then sat down and shrunk back into an old man. His uniform was still torn and his shoes split open, but now all there was was wrinkly skin and chipped toenails. 
my mouth was still open. Donna noticed and turned to me and said, Other businesses wouldn't employ Mr. Oliver as a security guard because of his age. Well, I saw past that and gave him a chance. This is not the first time that he has repaid my trust. And then she headed back in the direction of her office. And Katie, meanwhile, was giving Mr. Oliver a hug. And the Franks were nodding slowly. I finally shut my mouth and went to the restroom. I needed to splash some cold water on my face. I went back to work after this, but I couldn't stop thinking about what I had just witnessed. I had to know more. And for that, I needed to go all the way to the top. I finished replacing some kitchen rolls and detergent bottles and then went to the manager's office. On the way, I saw her going into the refrigerated area. Maybe she needs to cool down as well after all the excitement, I thought, with a nervous smile on my face and I followed her. She had already crossed the length of the room by the time that I entered and was opening the door marked Deep Freeze. I carried on after her but hesitated at the door. The sign saying no entry was clear. I shouldn't go in but I was just so desperate for an explanation. I decided to go for it. I turned the handle and opened the door, very slowly and as quietly as I could. Basically, I was sneaking in and feeling guilty about it. Once the door was open wide enough, I peered into the room. It was dimly lit and waves of freezing air were making my skin burn, and the inside of my mouth because once again it was hanging open. Donna was standing in the middle of the room talking to a man, who was frozen solid inside a large block of ice. Through the layer of ice I could see that his veins beneath his pale skin and that his eyes were closed. Donna was speaking very quietly, and I couldn't hear what she was saying but as I stood there watching, she smiled at the human popsicle, then blew it a kiss and turned away, and saw me. I was mortified. I knew that I shouldn't have been there. I started to mumble an apology, but Donna held up a hand to stop me and asked me to come with her to her office. And I trailed after her. I was still shaking even after I left the cold rooms. I thought that I was about to be fired. She asked me to take a seat, which I gratefully accepted before my legs gave way. And then she looked at me and said, the man you just saw me talking to was my husband. He was mortally wounded in a robbery attempt. I expect that Katie's already told you that. What she doesn't know is that after the incident, when I could see that he was dying, I dragged him into the deep freeze. I was out of my mind with shock, but a part of me was thinking that if I froze him, then I could keep him alive. Tears fell down her face as she spoke, and she didn't try and wipe them away as she went on. Afterwards, I lied and told the other staff that I had called the paramedics and that the cops that they were on their way. And then I sent the staff home and closed the store. And after that, I went back into the deep freeze and sat with my husband and talked to him until dawn. All the while, the ice particles were forming around his body. And now every night, I go into the deep freeze and I talk to him. I tell him how the story's doing. And I tell him that I love him and that I go back out to work. She finally wiped a hand across her cheek. And then she took a deep breath. So, that's it. That's my secret, she said. Acting with my heart rather than my head, I stood up and went over to her side of the desk and asked if it was okay to give her a hug. She nodded so I held her gently for a moment and told her that her secret was safe with me. And then I did the only thing that I could think of. I went back to work. Dawn was only an hour or so away and I was feeling pretty wiped out. But I wasn't going to slack off. As well as my feelings for Katie, I had really come to like Donna and Mr. Oliver. And even the Franks too. And I knew that there was so much about them and the store that I was still to discover. That could wait until my next shift, I thought because nothing else was going to happen that night. I couldn't have been more wrong.
It started with the roar of a motorbike engine outside, and then a second and a third, and so they went. I hurried to the front of the store to see what was happening. The Franks were at their tills and Mr. Oliver was in his chair. Katie and Donna joined us moments later. We looked out into the darkness and saw half a dozen or so motorbikes lined up facing the store. The drivers revved their engines in turn. All the motorbikes had passengers and they were climbing off and staring at the store. They were all carrying. I felt a trickle of cold sweat run down my neck. This was trouble. Who are they? Katie asked. Uh, varmints, Mr. Oliver replied. I can see the two lowlifes who tried robbing the store earlier. Looks like they brought their pack back with them to take revenge. The drivers were getting off their motorbikes as well, and it felt to me like there was a feral army out there and that we were their prey trapped in the store. We should call the cops, Katie said. Uh, by the time they get here, it'll be too late, Mr. Oliver replied. I can take some of them out, but not enough. My heart sank even further. The odds of us getting out of this situation alive felt like they were dropping by the second. I turned to Donna, desperately hoping that she would have an idea to save us, but... She was speaking quietly to the Franks. They were nodding slowly, seeming to understand, and when Donna finished, they rose and walked to the entrance, where they stood staring out into the distance. I got the feeling that they were staring beyond the biker gang, somehow reaching out deep into the scrublands. Whatever it was that they were doing, it did not matter anymore. The bikers were advancing in a ragtag line on the store. They were taking their time. They had their weapons propped on their shoulders and looked like they were enjoying this. Taking sick pleasure from the terror that they must have known we were experiencing inside the store, nausea rose inside me and I was on the verge of tears. I didn't want to die, I mean not like this. And all the while the bikers came closer and closer and all we could do was watch helplessly. And then Katie pointed into the distance. Look, she exclaimed. I couldn't see what she meant at first, but then I saw them. There were figures approaching from the distance. They were moving slowly, walking with an odd and uneven gait. They were a shuffling, shambling group, and there were a lot of them. A couple of dozen, maybe more. Who are they? I asked breathlessly. The Franks answered, their voices overlapping, they said in a guttural drawl, Frank. What the freaking? I began to think but never got to the end, because the bikers had seen that they had company now. One of the bikers span around and opened fire. He hit one of the approaching figures in the chest. It stopped in its tracks looked down at the smoldering hole which ran all the way through its body, then raised its arms and bared its teeth, and started walking forward again, right at the biker who had fired at it. I couldn't see his face, but I heard his scream as the figure bit into his shoulder. And all around this gruesome encounter, more and more of the bikers were being overwhelmed by the strange figures which had emerged from the night and saved us. I turned away, with a hysterical laugh bubbling up inside me, I thought of a new staff t-shirt slogan, Saved by Zombies. Because that's what those things must have been. Because that's what the Till Assistants, the Franks were. And somehow they had called in the undead Calvary. It was all clear to me now. Zombies and a shapeshifter. Donna wasn't kidding when she had told me that she'd like to give the unemployable a chance. Adrenaline was still pulsing through my body and I felt lightheaded as I made my way back to the aisles and went back to work. Thankfully, it was going to be light soon, which meant my first night shift was almost over. I was too tired and stressed to summon up the courage to ask Katie out. That would have to wait for another time. And perhaps after we had worked a few more night shifts together, but I did want to say goodbye. 
After replacing my final item of the night, I went looking for Katie, but I couldn't see her, so I headed back towards the door. She must have left already, I figured, and I looked outside at the sky. Flecks of red were appearing at the edges of the darkness, and there was something moving up there, something dark and quick. That suddenly swooped on low so that it was only inches from the door, and I saw that it was a bat and that it was looking right at me and another piece of the puzzle fell into place. Katie. Her pale skin, the way she smiled without showing her teeth, her camera not recording her. She was another of the strange. The girl that I loved was a vampire and before dawn rose, she needed to be away. The bat soared back up into the sky. I watched it until it was only a dot and then gone, lost to sight. Until the next night shift, I thought, and I headed for my car.